Hello, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Craig Boyce, and I'm the Dean of Cleveland Marshall College of Law. On behalf of the law school, it's an honor to be able to underwrite today's program, and it's a privilege for me personally to be able to ring that gong, um, uh, but more importantly, to introduce today's uh, speaker, Linda Greenhouse. At the law school where we train lawyers, uh, a lot of time is spent teaching, researching, publishing scholarship about our nation's highest court, the Supreme Court. Some of the court's more recent pronouncements have increasingly affected not just the contours of the legal landscape, but the way that we live our lives. Issues like same-sex marriage, voting rights, affirmative action, and gender equality, all of which have been or soon, been or soon will be addressed by the court, touch us where we live. Indeed, the court is presently poised to weigh in on the constitutionality of the largest overhaul of the health care system in our nation's history. That decision, like so many by the court, has profound implications for our economy and for the way that we live our lives. Ms. Greenhouse is here today to discuss the first decade of Chief Justice John Roberts' tenure at the helm of the court. When Justice Roberts took the center chair on the nation's highest court in September of 2005, he was the youngest Chief Justice since John Marshall, our nation's fourth Chief Justice who began his service in 1801. Last year, on the occasion of Chief Justice Roberts' ninth anniversary, Ms. Greenhouse wondered if his coming years might involve some sort of shift in position. She wrote, quoting here, uh, will Chief Justice Roberts preside over a robust conservative majority, or will he be a beleaguered dissenter left to watch from the sidelines as others build a jurisprudential legacy and deprive him of the chance to build a lasting one of his own? She went on to note that if the court's center of gravity moves to the left, so too could the Chief Justice migrate toward the center of the, of the new spectrum, thus staying in the game and retaining the ability to shape outcomes. We look forward to hearing how her analysis has evolved uh, and deepened over the last year. Few are in a better position to assess the Supreme Court's trajectory than Ms. Greenhouse. During her 30 years covering the High Court for the New York Times, Ms. Greenhouse was seen as so influential that critics of her coverage began referring to the Greenhouse effect. The, <laughs> the effect that uh, judges might be seeking uh, favorable media coverage. Without a doubt, her coverage influenced how many of us, both inside and outside the legal world, understood the court and its decisions. It's a wonderful thing, too, that she continues to write uh, a regular column for the, for the New York Times, most recently an uh, op-ed yesterday addressing the court's likely role in the issue of voter identification. Ms. Greenhouse currently holds three posts at Yale, Senior Research Scholar in Law, the Knight Distinguished Journalist in Residence, and the Joseph Goldstein Lecturer. Ms. Greenhouse is also a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, where she serves on the council, and she is one of only two non-lawyer mem honorary members of the American Law Institute. She's a national board member of the American Constitution Society and a member of the Council of the American Philosophical Society. It's also import important to note that she is a member of the Senate of Phi Beta Kappa, today's form, after all, is the City Club's annual Phi Beta Kappa endowed form. Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming today's speaker, Linda Greenhouse. Thanks very much. The dean gets to say, sit it up here in case I misbehave. You can. <laughs> gong me off or something. Uh, so I'm delighted to be here uh, in the following the footsteps of two people I greatly admire, President Obama and Brian Stevenson. Is there anybody here who actually came on Wednesday and Thursday? And is here? Oh my gosh. Okay, so you'll be entitled to collapse uh, uh, for the weekend. So uh, Dean nicely uh, read an excerpt from a column I wrote back in the fall as uh, the Supreme Court term was about to get underway, and he, he phrased the question whether I think my predictions have been borne out. And, and of course, the answer is for those of you who know the court schedule, the court hasn't yet actually decided any of these important issues. And um, I, I always tell my students with some regret that the semester, which ends at the end of April, will be over, and they'll be long gone from New Haven uh, by the time the court does decide these. And so. Um, we're still waiting to, to get the verdict on the current term, but I'm gonna, as is promised in the title of the talk, uh, step back and, and give you some reflections on the past 10 years. <clears throat> so 
This morning, as most of us were settling into our work days or whatever, the justices were meeting in their weekly closed door conference to consider uh, new cases to take up to add to their docket. And I've long thought that the court's agenda setting function, the ability to really set the legal conversation for the country, is one of the most important but most underappreciated uh, functions of the Supreme Court. It's a very opaque function because they don't, unlike a, an argument of a case, which of course takes place in public, it's not public, the votes are not announced. It takes four votes to add a case to the docket. Uh, those four may be reluctant to cast those votes unless they can count to five because of course it takes five votes to win. So it's a very important function that goes on and it was going on today with respect, as Dean Boyce mentioned, uh, to a voter ID case from Wisconsin. So back in 2008, the Supreme Court, the early Roberts Court, uh, rejected a constitutional challenge to voter ID. Uh, it was a case from Indiana, a case called Crawford, and the argument was made to the court that the requirement of government-issued voter identification uh, has a disparate impact, an unconstitutionally disparate impact on those voters who cannot easily get the voter ID, and those people tend to be poor people, elderly, and members of racial minorities, and the court was not too interested in hearing that. Uh, it was a facial challenge. That means the law had not yet gone into effect when the lawsuit was filed, and the court basically said no. So in the intervening uh, years, 17 additional states have enacted voter ID, uh, one of them being Wisconsin, and so <coughs> that, case uh, the, was the Federal Appeals Court, the Seventh Circuit in Wisconsin upheld the law, rejected the challenge uh, over a very vigorous dissent by Judge Richard Posner uh, from, Judge Posner had requested that the full court rehear the case and the court voted five to five, a tie that resulted in not rehearing the case. Judge Posner wrote a 30 page dissenting opinion from that. So this case goes before the court today. In the column that uh, Dean Boyce mentioned, I, I engaged in a thought experiment. I said, suppose this conference, the Justice's Conference, wasn't taking place this morning on March 20th, 2015, but it had taken place uh, two years ago, and let's, I'm getting it backwards, let's assume that the Shelby count, that the um, Selma, Alabama 50th anniversary of the Selma March, of the march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, a bloody Sunday, took place not earlier this month, but two years ago when the court was considering Shelby County. Would the court actually have had the nerve to do what the court did in the case called Shelby County against Holder, in which the court invalidated Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, the section that basically required states that had a history of engaging in discrimination in the right to vote to, get to be under federal supervision any time they made a voting change. This was the core of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which was the direct result of what happened at Selma, Alabama. Would the court really have had the nerve to do that? Well, that was my thought experiment. Of course, I really can't answer that, but if you look at the five to four decision that came down in Shelby County two years ago, uh, the Chief Justice writing for the minority, it's hard to think that any of those, the five justices in the majority uh, would actually have changed their minds. So. What I want to talk about is what I call the Roberts Project. I think there are three major themes of the Supreme Court majority, and it is a narrow majority uh, under the direction of John Roberts. One has to do with race, and it's probably the most important of the three. Uh, the project, I believe, of John Roberts through his entire uh, adult life, actually, and the members of his majority, is to get the government out of the business of counting by race, that means the government out of the business of protecting, actually, the rights of racial minorities against our history in this country. I find that an extremely uh, surprising and uh, disturbing thing in the year 2015. I'll get back to that. The number two uh, on the project, the Roberts Court project, is religion. Is carving out a bigger space for the exercise of religion or deference given to claims of religion in our public life. I'll get back to that. And number three is the First Amendment being invoked in ways that um, would surprise 
I think would surprise the framers of the First Amendment who talked about free speech. Instead, we're seeing free speech being uh, hi sort of hijacked as a tool of, of deregulation in the 21st century. Let me just step back a bit. We talk a lot about five to four, and obviously uh, what we're talking about is, in many cases before the Roberts Court, is four plus four plus Justice Kennedy, right? We all know that Justice Kennedy is the swing justice. It's important to realize that this is a historic anomaly. It's really uh, quite uncommon in Supreme Court history, if not unique, that there has been one justice to whom everybody argues, that there's been one justice in the middle. If you look back at the Berger years, which some of us in this room I think are old enough to remember, uh, the Supreme Court of the 1970s and early 1980s, uh, that certainly wasn't the case. There were a number of justices who were sort of in the middle. I mean, there was Warren Berger and William Rehnquist on one end, on, on the right end of the court spectrum. There was William Brennan and Thurgood Marshall on the left-hand side of the court spectrum. And in the middle, it was really up for grabs. Justices like Byron White, Potter Stewart, Lewis Powell, the younger John Paul Stevens. So anybody coming before the court really had to argue to the middle and, and make, a, make a broad argument that would, that would appeal to these middle justices. You couldn't win without them. So now the arguments are framed to Justice Kennedy. And what's particularly worth noting about Justice Kennedy is that on these three main parts of what I call the Roberts Project, race, religion, and the First Amendment, Justice Kennedy is very predictably on the conservative side. So I think it's really fair to say that Anthony Kennedy is not really up for grabs on any of these three issues. And that means that uh, the Roberts Court has been quite consistently and predictably uh, a court that has moved itself and, and the country to the right on, on these issues. So I'll get back to the project of race. So early in the Roberts Court <clears throat> in 2007, uh, there came down a case called Parents Involved, uh, really uh, setting the tone for the Roberts Court on race. And this case had to do with the constitutionality of school, I won't call them integration plans because the schools were already integrated. The effort by the public school systems of Louisville, Kentucky, and Seattle, Washington to maintain the hard-won gains of integration in those two school systems. One, Louisville, of course, had been de jure segregated and had been ordered desegregated by a federal court and had been under federal court supervision for many years but had come out from under it, having achieved a measure of integration. Um, Seattle, of course, had never been de jure integrated, but had very severe housing segregation, and so the public schools were highly <coughs> segregated by race, and they too had been under uh, federal court orders and had come out of it. And so these two school districts, popularly elected by the people of these communities, had, had enacted very modest measures of, of school assignments to maintain the gains of integration against the kind of pull of housing resegregation. And the question that came to the Supreme Court was, uh, were these efforts constitutional? And by a vote of five to four, the court said no, they were not. And you probably remember the John Roberts aphorism, which was not actually original uh, with him, although it's attributed to him, that the way to get beyond discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. Now that's a really profound way to deal with this problem that has beset this country for more than 200 years. And Justice Kennedy, to his credit, said, you know, it's more complicated than that. And he refused to sign John Roberts' opinion, but he agreed, concurring in the judgment, that the plans at issue were unconstitutional. So that started the Roberts Court off um, on the path that it's been on through the Voting Rights Act, Shelby County, two years ago, in which an opinion by Chief Justice Roberts said, uh, we don't have to keep these states under federal supervision anymore because we've solved the problem of race in America. So uh, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act has been overtaken by events. It's no longer a proportionate response to an identifiable problem. Congress no longer has the constitutional authority to keep it in effect. Uh, you've got to either change the formula, rejigger the, which of course knowing that this Congress would never do such a thing, um, or Section 5 is a dead letter. So that was 
That was the second major case. And the third one, <clears throat> of course, was the University of Texas affirmative action case, uh, Fisher against the University of Texas, a case that was moot the minute that it came to the court, but the court chose because the plaintiff had already attended and graduated from another university, having not gotten into uh, UT Austin. But the court proceeded to go ahead and decide it anyway. And what was very fascinating was it was an overreach. Uh, the four or five justices who had agreed to hear this case demonstrated, I think, uh, uh, a reach that exceeded their grasp. Shelby County, uh, excuse me, Fisher was a failed effort by the Roberts Court to get its hands on affirmative action. Uh, they s ended up, in an opinion by Justice Kennedy, sending the case back to the Federal Appeals Court that had upheld the University of Texas plan, telling them to kind of take a harder look and look again. So what's very interesting is they did take a harder look. They did look again, and they said, yeah, we still think it's constitutional. So that's back at the court now, awaiting the court's decision as to whether to take that case, and that'll be really interesting, whether the four or the five justices now think that they've got the goods to do what they really want to do, which is to overturn the University of Michigan affirmative action case in 2003 on the eve of the Roberts Court, where you had Justice Sandra Day O'Connor uh, writing for the majority that the affirmative action plan there, uh, which served to preserve diversity at the University of Michigan Law School, a compelling interest, uh, that that plan was constitutional. And of course, in 2006, Justice O'Connor left and was replaced by Justice Sam Alito, and that's made all the difference. I think that switch from O'Connor to Alito is one of the most consequential single vote switches uh, in certainly in the modern history of the Supreme Court. So that's race, and we, we're going to have a question period. We can talk a little more about it, <clears throat> get to religion. So last term, uh, the court decided a case with an opinion by Justice Kennedy called Town of Greece. The question in Town of Greece was the constitutionality under the Constitution's Establishment Clause of a practice at a town meeting in upstate New York, uh, which started, this town started its town meetings with um, a prayer, with an invocation. Uh, the practice was to invite a local minister to give the prayer. All the local ministers were of, from Christian denominations. So all the prayers for 20 years had been Christian. And they had not just been, you know, thank you, Lord, for bringing us together, but they were overtly praying in the name of Jesus and so on. They were overtly uh, Christological prayers. And uh, two citizens of that town objected, uh, brought an Establishment Clause lawsuit, uh, prevailed in the Federal Appeals Court in New York. And of course, the Supreme Court took this case and reversed. Uh, and Justice Kennedy, writing for the five to four majority, said, well, uh, we understand that uh, these individuals were offended by this, um, by this continual praying any time they had to show up and do their business at the, at the town board. But, you know, we're all grown-ups, and we all have to put up a speech that we don't like. And so basically, it was a kind of a, the constitutional rule that emerged from the town of Greece opinion, I think, was the, the common law doctrine of suck it up. So um, this case provoked um, very heartfelt dissenting opinion from Justice Elena Kagan. Uh, but I think it stands as one of the, it didn't get a whole lot of attention, but it stands as one of the most surprising uh, Supreme Court opinions in, in my tenure because it was just so clear that not too many years ago uh, this practice would have been held unconstitutional. In fact, the really quite conservative Federal Appeals Court uh, for the Fourth Circuit in the sort of Middle South uh, had declared just such a practice unconstitutional a couple of years earlier. And it, that itself is quite interesting because the, the main marker that the Supreme Court uses uh, to deem a case worthy of their attention is a conflict among the federal circuits, the federal courts of appeals, about an issue. There was no conflict in the circuits on this question of Christological town prayer. Uh, the Fourth Circuit and the Second Circuit had both ruled the same way, that it was unconstitutional. The court took it anyway. So that tells us that they took it in advance of an agenda. Of course, we can't talk about religion without talking about Hobby Lobby, the case that came down last June, uh, in which the court deferred to the religious claims of the owners of Hobby Lobby, a 
company, actually. I had never heard of it until this case came up, but I learned that it's a national company with hundreds of stores and uh, tens of thousands of employees, a uh, for-profit, privately held company with religious owners who said, we cannot possibly uh, comply with the federal mandate to include contraception in the health plan that we offered to our employees. P.S., the interesting thing about this was they had, in fact, included the very birth control methods that they then said they couldn't possibly include uh, before the issue became politicized. So the Hobby Lobby owners allowed themselves to be the sort of poster children for this uh, national campaign to inject religion into our public life. And what they had previously done, they said, oh my gosh, we didn't know that. Now we can't possibly do that. So the court's opinion, five to four opinion in Hobby Lobby, was actually somewhat narrow because it was not actually a constitutional holding. It came up under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. It was a statutory holding that basically said, because the, Supreme, because the Obama administration offers a, quote, accommodation to purely religious organizations, uh, they can ask the Department of Health and Human Services for a waiver that would allow their third-party insurers to provide the coverage so they don't have to do it themselves. They don't have to be complicit in the sin of using birth control themselves. Uh, the court said that shows that there's a way to do this, and so uh, that's what the administration has to do. But the interesting wrinkle of this, of course, is that, that the, these, re these religious owners of for-profit companies say that, oh, even asking for the accommodation makes us complicit in the sin of using birth control. So we can't even be, requi be required to do that. So that's the next question for the court. That's hanging out there. And there are cases in the pipeline that will uh, <clears throat> give the court the, the chance to talk about that. The Religious Freedom Restoration Act is really a huge accident waiting to happen. Uh, it's, a, it's a law that Congress um, wrote in great haste for reasons that we don't have time to go into right now, but uh, take it from me, it was a real overreach that has succeeded in uh, greatly expanding the free exercise clause while, uh, in effect, effacing the establishment clause, the two twin cla religion clauses of the First Amendment. Uh, one of the few important cases that the court has actually decided this term is a Religious Freedom Restoration Act case, a case called Holt against Hobbes, in which a, uh, a state prisoner a Muslim state prisoner said, I have to wear a beard for religious reasons. And so he brought a challenge under this law uh, to a prison, a state prison regulation that said no beards, and he won. Well, what interested me about this case is that actually, I'm no expert on Islam, but from reading the briefs in this case, Muslim men are not actually required uh, to wear beards. But the Supreme Court said, we don't get into deciding what religion requires. We just defer to a religious claim, per se. So it'll be very interesting when the next prisoner case comes up, you know, the Church of Filet Mignon. And <laughs> there have been such cases. You know, in the past, they were laughed out of court. But you know, my religion requires me to have this and that and that benefit. And we'll see how the court sorts out these claims under the Religious Freedom Restoration. I don't mean to be flip, but we're really on the edge of a kind of extreme regime here. And I'd be very interested to see uh, what kind of boundaries the Supreme Court's going to set. So I'll spend my last few minutes talking about the First Amendment. And you know, it's very interesting. I mean, most of us were brought up to salute the First Amendment, right? It's just a good thing. It's a good thing we have the First Amendment. It's what makes us different from many uh, societies in the world, and you know, we're all taught to say the antidote to speech we don't like is more speech, and it's all very, it's a kind of a feel-good thing, but I think in the hands of the current court, it's become a good deal more complicated than that. I mean, I could start, of course, with Citizens United, but I really don't have to start with Citizens United, because everybody has an opinion on that, and that's probably the Roberts Court case that is the most well-known and probably the most disliked by many people, the ability of uh, corporations to spend unlimited amounts of money in politics, but that really is just the, the tip of the iceberg. And uh, what we've seen in recent, in these recent years, in the Roberts Court years, uh, is the First Amendment being, as I said at the beginning, invoked as a tool of deregulation. For example, there was an early Roberts Court case, a uh, case from Vermont, 
uh, Sorrell against IMS Health. Uh, the Vermont legislature thought it was uh, quite unfortunate that Big Pharma was engaged in the practice of data mining and would get from pharmacies the names of physicians who were prescribing various drugs, uh, various uh, pharmaceuticals, and they would then use this information to send their representatives to these doctors and say, don't use that, uh, you know, cheap generic, use our brand new expensive, you know, drug. And uh, <coughs> Vermont decided this was, uh, that the interests of consumers were not well served by this practice, and so they passed a law barring the data mining. And the Supreme Court overturned the law on First Amendment grounds and said that this exchange of information was in fact speech that was protected by the First Amendment, and the law was unconstitutional. Uh, there also, the court is also invoking the First Amendment in the labor area, uh, and I think it's very likely that the ability of public employees to maintain unions that have any source of revenue, uh, dues revenue, uh, is just hanging by a thread. So particularly Justice Sam Alito has been on the warpath about this. Uh, and the claim is that employees who don't want to join a union should no longer be required to pay that, to pay dues, that portion of dues that supports the representation activities of the union. This is an old uh, conflict that's been going on in labor law and in the Supreme Court for many decades. And the settlement that had been achieved uh, through a series of cases that respected the First Amendment rights of public employees who chose not to join a union is that they didn't have to pay that portion of dues that went to the union's political activities or anything outside the workplace, but so that they wouldn't be free riders on the union's uh, representational activities, they did have to pay that portion of dues. Now, at least some justices seem to think even that is a First Amendment violation, and Justice Alito, in a case that came down uh, last spring, Harris against Quinn, couldn't quite get that outcome out of the facts of that case, and basically he said, bring me another case. I'd really like to get my hands on this issue, but it's gotta be in the right case, and the right case has just reached the court. Uh, it's a case from the Ninth Circuit, California, uh, called Friedrichs, and it's a challenge, um, an anti-union challenge to uh, public employees union for teachers in California, and I think it's very likely that the court will take this case, and that's gonna be a major decision, <clears throat> not for this term, but it'll be argued and decided in the next term. So with that kind of overview of the Roberts Project, and I just have a couple minutes left, of course, brings us to the current term. And there's two major cases, uh, one of which has been argued, one of which is gonna be argued on, on the 28th of April. The first one is the healthcare case, uh, King against Burwell that the dean mentioned, and the second, of course, are the marriage cases. Uh, one of which is from Ohio, and I don't have to tell people um, anything specific about that except to say that um, Justice Kennedy's role here really is counter to what I said in the beginning, where Justice Kennedy is a predictable uh, conservative vote in these three agenda, these three project agenda issues. I think uh, marriage equality and um, the rights of gays and lesbians is actually part of Justice Kennedy's project. And he's been uh, the justice who's really been responsible, uh, starting in a case called Romer against Evans and through Lawrence against Texas in 2003 and through Windsor two years ago, the Defense of Marriage Act case, uh, who's written with um, <coughs> really uh, a fascinating and heartfelt language about the dignity uh, and equality of um, LGBT people. So I think we're definitely on the verge of uh, the marriage case, the claim in the marriage case is prevailing. Uh, exactly what the vote will be, what the uh, legal analysis will be, what level of scrutiny the court will apply, I don't know, but I think none of that actually ma matters at the end of the day. I think there will be a nationwide uh, regime of marriage equality. The only, my only concern about it is that I hope that that victory of an amazingly effective social movement won't erase in the public mind the other things that I've been uh, talking about. On the healthcare case, I think is hanging by a thread. Um, it's not actually a constitutional case, it's a statutory case that invites the court to interpret uh, five words in a 900-page statute. And uh, if the court uses its normal uh, 
means of statutory interpretation, of course the government will win and uh, the Affordable Care Act will remain intact. Uh, if the court, for political reasons, uh, decides to apply another kind of analysis, then the government will lose, and in my opinion, uh, then we all lose. And so it's really uh, the Roberts Court, at the end of its 10th year, is um, the court on the spot. So I appreciate your attention, and watch that space. Totally fascinating, Linda, thank you so much. Last summer we had um, Robbie Kaplan here. Um, we heard a lot about that then. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we're enjoying a Friday forum featuring Linda Greenhouse. She's the Knight Distinguished Journalist in Residence and the Joseph M. Goldstein Fellow at Yale Law School. We're gonna take questions in a moment and we, we encourage you to organize your questions now and remind you too that your questions should be brief and to the point and preferably questions. Um, I'm Dan Malthrop, by the way, Chief Executive here, and we welcome all of you here and those joining us via 90.3 WCPN, WVIZ PBS, 104.9 WCLV Idea Stream, uh, which is our primary media partner, or one of the many other radio stations and television stations across the region and country that carry City Club programs. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC, and our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. Be sure to join us on Friday, March 27th, as we open our Year of Clean Water series with Edwin Pinheiro, Senior Vice President for Sustainability and Public Affairs at Veolia Water North America. For more information about our upcoming and past forums, please visit us online at cityclub.org. Today's forum is sponsored by the Cleveland Marshall College of Law at Cleveland State University. We thank you very much for your support. Today's forum is also the Phi Beta Kappa Endowed Forum at the City Club of Cleveland, made possible by, a generous, by the generous members of the Cleveland Association of Phi Beta Kappa. We thank you very much for your support. Our community partners for today's program are the Cleveland Association of Phi Beta Kappa and the Chandra Law Firm, LLC. Thank you very much for your assistance today. And we welcome guests at tables hosted by the ACLU of Ohio, the Chandra Law Firm, the Cleveland Association of Phi Beta Kappa, John Carroll University, and Squire Patton Boggs. Thank you very much. We also welcome students to today's program from Shaw High School. Student participation is made possible by a generous grant from the Lobb Foundation. Will our friends from East Cleveland please stand to be recognized? <laughs> now it's time for the City Club Q&A and we welcome questions from everyone, members and guests alike. Holding our microphones today are our Director of Programming, the hardest working woman in Cleveland, Stephanie Jansky, and our intern, Wesley Allen. Our first question, please. Ms. Greenhouse, uh, there's the law of in unintended consequences. Prior to the nomination of Robert Bork, Supreme Court nominees seem to at least get a fairly neutral uh, reception in Congress and the President's desires were usually adopted. Since Robert Bork, it seems every nominee has been terribly contentious and it seems to have led to a politicization of the whole process. Uh, is that a fair analysis? Actually, that's not an accurate historical analysis. You remember the names Hainsworth and Carswell? Okay. So these were Nixon appointees uh, in around the year 1970, and the Senate defeated them, and that what led, that's what led to old number three, uh, Harry Blackman. And then subsequent to the Bork uh, hearing, Bork confirmation process, uh, you might recognize the names of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Stephen Breyer, and those were not contentious nominations. Uh, those were nominations in which the president really sort of played to the middle. Uh, and they, those were easily confirmed. So I think the contentiousness of the nomination really depends on the nominee and on the politics uh, of the moment and on the relationship between the president and the Senate and so on. Uh, so I infer from your question, but tell me if I'm wrong, that you think something went wrong in the Bork hearing. But Actually, I mean, I, I, I teach this material, and I just spent a week uh, with my students on the Bork hearing because it is so important. Uh, something very important happened there. And what actually happened was a fascinating constitutional conversation that the nomination and the response to the nomination engendered throughout the whole country on the essential meaning of the Constitution as it had been interpreted starting around um, 
the 1940s up to the present on the, on the modern meaning of the Constitution. And so when you had Robert Bork um, dismissing the case of Griswold against Connecticut, the 50th anniversary of which we're celebrating this year, Griswold against Connecticut was the case that held that a married couple has a constitutional right to use birth control. And Robert Bork said he saw no constitutional basis for that opinion. Uh, you know, the country kind of took a look at that and took a deep breath and said, well, you know, bring us somebody else. <laughs> and so uh, the one who replaced Robert Bork was Anthony Kennedy. Uh, you know, no, uh, no card-carrying liberal, that's for sure, and was, you know, as we were discussing for the previous half hour. But um, somebody who has a, a very different constitutional vision, and I think one that um, certainly on these social issues is a good deal closer to what the country seems to want. I appreciate your deep analysis of the court. I have two questions, really, and I wonder how the Chief Justice uh, won manages the opinion process and whether his activity in that is crucial to the way uh, coalitions get developed or opinions, I know he assigns opinion things, but you know, that it works out the way he wants it to. And secondly, do you think he'd ever support uh, television in the Supreme Court for arguments? Okay, so take your first case. Of course, the Chief Justice only has one vote. He's one out of nine, uh, but he does have the power by tradition to assign the opinion in any case in which he's in the majority. Uh, so that's his strategic use of power, and you want to be fair about it, and you want to spread out the work evenly, and you want to let your colleagues get a shot at the interesting cases. And typically what the assigning justice is cognizant of, if it's a very close case, often the opinion goes to the member of your coalition who's the most shaky to sort of anchor that person in by giving that person the opinion writing. Uh, that's why Justice Kennedy has gotten a lot of major opinions over the years because he's the one that uh, you know either, either side needs. Um, so that's kind of how that, that works. And I haven't heard any criticism of, uh, of the way Chief Justice Roberts uses that, uses that power. Uh, on television in the courtroom, um, I don't think it's up to him. I don't think the court would take that step unless it was unanimous. And um, enough justices have indicated that they're not in favor of it that I think I would not hold my breath uh, uh, for that. There was a very interesting essay yesterday, maybe it was in USA Today, um, by a journalism maven of some kind uh, talking about the trial that's going on now, the federal district court trial in the uh, Boston Marathon bombing case, which of course is not on television because federal court trials are not on television. And what he was saying was um, how lucky he thinks it is that it's not on television because it's a very serious, sober proceeding, uh, victims telling their stories and so on. And he said it would just have a whole different atmosphere if the sound bites from the victim, you know, replayed and replayed, uh, I mean, for the multiple victims, and, uh, you know, if this kind of sweet-looking but seemingly deeply evil defendant, uh, you know, if his face was out on television all the time. It's just, I, I found it a very provocative piece. I mean, personally, I'm quite agnostic, as you can tell right, right, uh, on, on this issue, but I don't think we're going to have to confront it at the Supreme Court anytime soon. like to welcome you to the Western Reserve of Connecticut. <laughs> and um, about 200 years ago, um, our country was founded on the basis of uh, no taxation without representation. Uh, our founding fathers uh, quickly came up with a constitution that deprived a majority of the uh, uh, citizenry uh, the right to vote. And only uh, about two. Uh, it took about 200 years to realize that ideal. Uh, how far back, right now we seem to be re, uh, going back in history, rewriting uh, history. How far back do you think this uh, court's going to allow history to go? Well, um, the court has a chance, I think, in the current round of voting cases. Uh, some have to do with voter ID, some have to do with redistricting 
to um, get us back on the right path and to uh, recognize that the highest and greatest good is enabling the most people to vote without obstacle. Uh, whether they'll do that, uh, you know, we'll soon see. I don't know any more than that. Good afternoon. Um, as a female law professor, someone who cares deeply about women's rights, I wanted to ask you about Roe versus Wade. Do you see in the near future a challenge to Roe versus Wade, and do you, do you think it's likely that the Roberts Court would attempt to restrict or overturn Roe versus Wade? Uh, I think the court would overturn Roe against Wade if they had five votes. I don't think they have five votes. Um, there are cases in the pipeline that offer either direct challenges to Roe or sort of more to the point, um, give the court, would require the court to tell us what the undue burden standard, which is what the court adopted in 1992 in Planned Parenthood against Casey actually means. How, how burdensome does a burden on access to abortion have to be before it becomes constitutionally undue and, and thus unconstitutional. That's an issue that's out there and has come to the fore in this current round of uh, state restrictions that have required clinics to close. And, and those are all, uh, there's not a case yet that's been litigated to conclusion. Um, well, there is one, the Mississippi case, um, the Jackson Women's Health Organization case in which the very conservative Fifth Circuit said, no, you can't have a regulation that would require the one remaining clinic in the state of Mississippi to close. You can't do that. The state had said, well, they can cross state lines. The court said, no, in our federal system, you don't have a system where in order to exercise your constitutional rights, you have to cross the state line. And the Supreme Court has been asked to, um, to take that case, and I actually don't think they will. It's in such an unattractive posture. But there are a number of other cases. Uh, the state of West Virginia, the legislature has just passed over the governor's veto um, a, a, a bill that outlaws abortion after 20 weeks, which is before viability, which is a direct affront to Roe against Wade and Planned Parenthood against Casey. Uh, so that will be in court immediately. You know, it'll take a while. It'll get up to the Supreme Court eventually. And, you know, we'll see. But I think anybody who cares about reproductive rights is extremely concerned um, with what's going on right now. Uh, on the heels of President Obama's visit to Cleveland, I was wondering if you could give us your impression thus far on his nominees to the court. On uh, Elena Kagan and Sonia Sotomayor. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I think they, those are very fine nominations. I think those are terrific justices. Of course, in the current, um, you know, the way things are going, they haven't really, you know, had a chance to, um, to shine through majority opinions, but they've written um, some boffo dissenting opinions, uh, you know, <laughs> laying down their markers, and they're both quite young. And, uh, you know, depending on the turn of politics uh, in the next um, two years or six years or who knows, uh, they'll still be there. And um, I would have hopes that someday they'll be speaking for uh, not just um, themselves plus two others. Uh, good afternoon, Ms. Greenhouse. My name is Anthony Price, and I'm a junior at Shaw High School, and along with that youth board council member here at City Club. And I aspire to be a public judge and maybe one day uh, U.S. Supreme Court Justice. And so I, I've <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And so I, I, I have a few students who make the same one. <laughs> And so you talked about many cases, U.S. Supreme Court cases, and you're an expert on the U.S. Supreme Court. And so I was wondering, what is one main quality that maybe if I ever become a U.S. Supreme Court justice, uh, you know, what is that main quality that a nominee needs in the near future? In the near future? <laughs> uh, You know, I think, um, I think you need to be true to yourself, you know? You don't, you, you shouldn't think, oh my gosh, I might face a confirmation hearing someday and so I better be careful what I say, what I tweet, what I write. Um, you know, when, when um, 
when the first vacancy presented itself to uh, President Obama and he said he was going to look for a nominee with empathy. That was um, greatly criticized on the right as meaning, you know, a soft and a squishy, uh, you know, do-good liberal type of nominee. And that's actually not what the president meant, and empathy is a really good word, and it simply means uh, the ability to um, put yourself in somebody else's shoes and understand uh, where somebody else is coming from. And uh, I think that's one thing that's lacking in the Supreme Court today, and I'm guessing that uh, you have a good dose of it, and I just would urge you to hang on to it. Hello. Um, when uh, Chief Justice Roberts first came to the court, you and others interviewed him, and he said that he wanted to work for collegiality on the court, which meant that he wanted more 9-0 and more unanimous decisions. I just wanted to see how, what you thought 10 years after that. How is that going? Um, <laughs> Outside of the maybe the Roberts project, is it more unanimous outside of those more non-contentious issues? And if so, are those papering over more legally contentious issues like getting nine members? Are legal issues going unaddressed because of that? Yeah, well, that's interesting. So, um, <clears throat> so last term there were a lot of unanimous opinions. I, I forget the actual numbers, but you know more than usual. Uh, and so I saw a lot of writing that said, "Oh, the Roberts Court is having so many unanimous opinions." And I did not write that because I don't believe that because those, as you suggest, those opinions did paper over major differences and they were nine nothing in result, but they were not nine nothing in analysis. And really, I mean, of course, results matter a whole lot at the Supreme Court, but also the analysis matters a whole lot because the court in deciding an opinion is looking ahead to the next cases and the cases after that that are gonna be engendered by, by this opinion. So. Um, uh, so, for example, uh, the court was unanimous um, in a case called uh, McCullen against Coakley, which had to do with the First Amendment constitutionality of a buffer zone around abortion clinics in Massachusetts. Massachusetts set a 35-foot um, limit. And so the question was, is this, you know, does this cut off too much speech? And, and Chief Justice Roberts wrote an opinion uh, the result was nine to nothing, saying yes, it does cut off too much speech, and, and it's not, he said, it's not because it's speech pro or con about abortion, it's just speech and a time, place, and manner uh, regulation of speech. Um, you know, they can, they can regulate it, but they, they can't, have, excuse me, can't have quite so big a buffer. Uh, Justice Scalia and Thomas and Alito, I believe, wrote a concurring opinion saying, oh, no, the court really should have taken this on as a restriction on um, speech against abortion, and we really should have had a much richer First Amendment uh, holding on, on that. Uh, you know, so the Roberts opinion, which got the votes of people like Justice Ginsburg, you know, was very kind of flat and dry and didn't really say anything about abortion. And the Scalia group really wanted to dig in and overturn uh, previous opinions of the court that had protected abortion clinics. So that was an example. You could look at, oh, nine, nothing, okay. But it really, that wasn't the real story at all. And there were a number of those. So I think um, before people come to kind of um, superficial judgments, and there's a lot of that going on, um, about what's up with the court, you just have to sort of dig into the details and, and make your own judgment. Welcome to Cleveland. You gave an example when you were talking about the town prayer case in which the conservative majority appeared to choose a case where there was no circuit conflict. The usual legal principles of deciding whether to even hear a case weren't used. I've heard that Citizens United, the actual issue decided by the court, wasn't the issue as framed by the parties because it would have been considered too extreme and radical. As a close observer of the court, what other indicia or facts have you seen that suggest to you that there's an actual agenda or set of projects here to try to advance that go beyond traditional legal principles in the way our Supreme Court has operated over the couple centuries of our republic? Thanks. I mean, I could actually cite a lot of cases, I could, some, several important cases just along those lines. For instance, parents involved, the Louisville and Seattle case that I mentioned. So when 
in the closing months of Justice O'Connor's tenure, a case presenting the same issue on what school districts can do to maintain integration after coming out from under some kind of court order or something, uh, came up to the court, and it was a case from uh, a town in Massachusetts. It was a case from the First Circuit. There was no circuit conflict, uh, and the court turned it down. The minute Justice O'Connor left, these two new cases, one from the Sixth Circuit, the Kentucky case, and one from the Ninth Circuit, the Seattle case, came in, and still no circuit conflict because both of those circuits had said these plans were constitutional. And the court uh, took those cases to conference about seven or eight times before deciding what to do. And obviously, with Justice O'Connor gone and Justice Alito there, it was a new day, and they took them. So that was one. Uh, another one is the pending health care case, King against Burwell. So on the same day last July, uh, two federal circuits issued opinions on this statutory matter of whether uh, people in the states that have not established their own exchanges can get the tax credits when they buy insurance on the federal exchange. The D.C. Circuit ruled against the government. The Fourth Circuit, in the cases now before the court, ruled for the government. The D.C. Circuit took the case on bank, which means that the panel opinion was vacated. It did not exist any longer and set an argument date for the full court to hear it. That meant there was no circuit conflict. The only panel opinion that existed in the country was from the Fourth Circuit, and the court took it anyway. So, uh, you know, I'm very confident in uh, being able to propound this notion of an agenda because I think the facts really, uh, re really support it. In King versus Burwell, if Justice Scalia joins an opinion agreeing with the plaintiffs, what happens to his legacy as an analyst of legal texts? Well, I mean, so, I mean, that's a very profound question that people may, you know, non, people not inside this discourse may not quite understand. So Justice Scalia is famously has written, uh, you know, books about how to interpret uh, legislation. And uh, what he's written and what he said is, uh, you don't pick a word here and a word there, you know, looking out over the crowd and picking out, you know, the words that help you. Uh, you look at language in context. And it's just totally clear that in context, uh, the, the five words, yeah, five words, exchange established by the state, does not, those words do not act to disable the exchanges established on behalf of the state by the federal government uh, from uh, providing the tax credits to consumers, and so if, uh, for political reasons, Justice Scalia decides that the plaintiffs are right on this, um, you know, let the chips fall where they may, so. Uh, again, thank you for coming to Cleveland. I would like to tie together two strands of things you talked about. One is the RIFRA line and the same-sex marriage line. The next battleground for LGBT community is likely to be a clash between the two. Totally right. Cases like Elaine Photography from New Mexico that the court did yep. not accept. Uh, could you speak a little bit about the clash, and in particular because of Justice Kennedy's dual uh, citizenship in both uh, directions? <laughs> yeah, well, so that's really the question of the hour. I mean, assuming marriage equality by the end of this term, uh, that's not the end of the conversation. And so uh, what the question is alluding to are all these claims that, uh, you know, we have a constitutional right to discriminate. And these cases have come up, you know, I'm a baker, I have a, I'm a religious baker, I don't have to bake a cake for a same-sex wedding. I mean, you know, they, they sound like, it sounds like a joke, but it's actually not a joke. These are real cases, and these reflect um, something that's really, uh, you know, out there. Uh, I just read, did I read in this morning's paper that Governor Bush, maybe future President Bush number three, I don't know, uh, has endorsed, um, exceptions for discrimination against LGBT people in anti-discrimination legislation. Right. Uh, so this is, these are going to be um, major battles just on, this, uh, on the statutory front as well as on the, as well as on the constitutional front. And I think it's going to take um, a good deal of political organizing and, uh, you know, the same kind of brilliant litigation strategy that has taken the movement to the threshold of, of where it is. Um, but I think, uh, you know, these claims of religious conscience and complicity in 
uh, honoring a, a national rule of non-discrimination, I would just ask people to substitute African American for gay and see what you know they think they can get away with. And, and uh, you know, it's the same thing, right? So um, I think we've got to stay very focused and not be uh, polite about uh, pushing back and, and rejecting uh, these religious-based um, claims to the right to discriminate. President Obama's executive order on immig oh, do you see President Obama's executive order on immigration being fought all the way up to the Supreme Court? Uh, I don't know, actually, uh, because the, um, the district court order was so, um, you know, kind of wacky that, um, uh, you know, it's not a constitutional holding. It's the judges saying that um, uh, the president needed to engage in notice and comment rulemaking before issuing the executive order. So, um, you know, whether this is a certworthy issue for the Supreme Court or whether it's just going to be kind of sorted out administratively along the way, um, I don't know. I wouldn't bet on it becoming a Supreme Court case. Today at the City Club, we've been enjoying a Friday forum featuring Linda Greenhouse, the Knight Distinguished Journalist in Residence, and the Joseph M. Goldstein Fellow at Yale Law School. Thank you, Mrs. Greenhouse. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned.